Well, good morning once again, everybody. And I just want to welcome, can we welcome the folks that are watching online right now or later on? Just want to let you know that you are important to God, more, even more important than you are to us, but you're important to God. And uh, the reason I say that for, because I know people are watching and perhaps even later on, and uh, the parts of the service are cut out, but this is uh, this remains, so I wanted to say a welcome to you and welcome to everyone else who's on the road. Uh, we are in the middle of a series called It Is Written, and I'm telling you, I just love it because I'm gaining even more and more confidence knowing that the Word of God is something you can trust. And this is not just some document. This is not some arbitrary document. It's not some ancient thing that you do well. My friends, we really believe this is actually the Word of God. I want to encourage you to go to cornerstonecheshire.com and catch up on last week's message where I went into explaining how the Gospels are authentic and how there's so many proofs for the Gospels alone. Today we're going to focus on the Bible and, and how you can trust the Bible. And it's absolutely astounding. And I'm going to be doing some teaching and preaching. We call it treaching. Okay? So you're going to, it's a little bit more than normal, but we're going to be looking at what the Bible has to say and how we can trust what the Bible has to say and how important it is. All right? So I want to just go ahead and review a couple of things. All right? I want to review a couple of things, and I just wanted to say there's many people out there that don't know how to make decisions, and we wonder, well, what am I supposed to do? And a lot of people today, there is no right, there is no wrong. Truth is relative to what you think. I have my truth, you, are, you have your truth. That's ridiculous. Try to play a ball game doing that. It, it just wouldn't work. There would be no Major League Baseball. There would be no football team. You couldn't even pack a stadium. There would be chaos, right? There's rules for a reason. My friends, God has put structures in place that are there for a reason, because he loves us. It's his word. As I heard a couple people will say, uh, basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E. It's a love letter. It is God's instruction book. But let me say something very important, because a lot of you have been whacked over the head and beat up with the gospel, beat up with the Bible. Cars are great. Get you from point A to point B. But a car misuse can kill. My friends, let me say something very, very important. The Bible without a relationship with Jesus Christ is dangerous. Let me say that again. The Bible without a relationship with Jesus Christ is dangerous. And so remember that, everybody. It's not just this. So let's go ahead and talk about the word and let's look into it right now. It is written. If you guys can put me to the countdown clock so I know how much time I left, thank you. Uh, we had to do that for parking reasons, okay? Just want to let you guys know that. I wish we had a bigger parking lot. And we'll talk about that in the future. Okay. It is written. The most powerful source in the universe, a little review, is in, the, in every realm is the word of God. It's the most powerful force. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What's that word? Jesus. Okay? Jesus is the word and the foundation of all things. Everything that's held together is because of the spirit of Christ. I'll show you right now in the scriptures. It says this, for by him, that's Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things are hold together it is literal is not a an analogy jesus christ holds it all together we mentioned this the molecules on the stage that hold me up here the fact that you're beating today the spirit of christ his energy his signature is in all created things it brings order it holds it all together without the spirit of christ it crumbles apart science talks about this we talk about it for weeks and weeks i want to remind you that and so if you ever feel like you're falling apart, you need more of the Spirit of Christ in you. More freedom of the frequency of Jesus in your life. The more he reverberates in your life, the more whole you are. The more we allow his access point, the more we allow his power, his grace, and his love to flow through us, the more whole we are. It's our advantage for that. So everyone who hears these words, this is Jesus speaking, Words, logos, all right? Of mine and puts them to practice is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. So this is, we talk about that. Spirit of Christ holds it all together, all right? 
We build a foundation. Listen to the words. A lot of us listen to the words. We know the words, but we don't do it. And this is not legalism. This is an opportunity. Okay? I know it's difficult, and I know that we've, maybe some of you have grown up on, in a church where the church of the do-nots, right? Can't do that, can't do this, can't do the other. Uh, maybe you had Pentecostal buns in the church. Those are the tight. Okay, I better stop. I'll get myself into trouble. You know what we call those tight Pentecostal buns? They call it bondage. Anyhow. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't help myself. Yeah, I could, but I didn't want to. All right. Anyhow, but, uh, and so everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into practice. And so what's happening is we're saying, uh-uh. You know, that may be true back then, but we believe it this way. So what we're doing is we're literally pulling out stones out of our foundation. And all of a sudden, the walls begin to crack in the structure of our homes. The next thing you know, the, the floor is creaking. The next thing you know, we start sinking. And what, what's going on in our culture today? Look what we've done in our culture. We're taking God, taking the truth of God out of our culture, and look what's happening. There is no God. You evolve from an ape. Therefore, why is it wrong for someone to go into a high school and shoot people up if you're just an animal? There's no God, so what's the difference? Can you see the consequences of that? We see that you can do whatever you want to do, be whatever you want to be. It doesn't make a difference. If you tell me I can't be something, then you're hating me. And you see the cataclysmic problems it causes psychologically. It's amazing. When you pull out the structure of how God has designed us, you actually do yourself harm. God is not up there saying, good. No, what we're doing is we're pulling things out of the foundation. And as we do that, we have disorder. Disorder causes chaos. And things begin to crumble. Not because God is angry, because you violate his moral codes. I hope you understand that, everybody. Okay? So, we're going through this right now. <clears throat> Question is this. Can I trust the Bible? Last week, we went through Gospels, and we did a good... I, Wait, did a good job. I think we did a decent job of trying to explain it to you. I'm not going to re-preach it, okay? But can we trust the Bible? And resoundingly, I will say yes. In fact, I will tell you, I, there's more evidence that will prove that the Bible is authentic and true and you can trust it and it's the Word of God than there is evidence to prove it's not. I'm convinced of it. Okay, this is what Jesus has to say. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. I'll be here. One day this will be dust. One day the earth is going to blow up in fire. Aren't you encouraged right now by hearing that? One day the whole earth will be destroyed. But guess what's going to continue? It'll be remade. The word of God. The word of God always was, always is. It's the constant. It's the one thing that you cannot touch and you cannot change. The word of God is the word of God. He was, he is, and he always will be. He's the prime mover. He's the final. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so what we believe is what we believe that in the Bible, it's not the complete word of God, but everything in here is completely the word of God. So this is the word of God. The 66 books of the Bible, how did they put it together and how did they do that? We'll talk about that a little bit more. We did a little bit last week and how they put the canon together. And the canon is simply an agreed, um, authentic, agreed upon books, which we can talk about another time. Uh, in fact, Pastor Rich is doing a course, How to Understand the Bible. Great. Encourage you to get involved with that. It's still not too late. All right. We also mentioned this, and I'll encourage you to look at josh.org. Not, not Josh in the church, okay? We have a couple Joshes. I'm talking about Josh. can't remember his last name. What's his last name again? McDowell. Thank you so much. I, I apologize, everybody. I just can't remember everyone's names. Um, that's why I need Jesus, and that's why I need coffee. Praise the Lord. Josh McDowell. But uh, dot josh.org, you can go there. It's apologetics. What's apologetics? Apologetics, I hate the word apologetics because it's not like we're apologizing. We're not apologizing. But it comes from the Latin root. Basically what it is to give a reason for what you believe. Uh, Peter says, be ready at all seasons to, give, uh, to talk about the hope that you have. Listen, we're not trying to defend the undefendable. We're not trying to defend a tooth fairy story. Okay, this is truth. And, and so we have nothing to fear about this. Truth can handle any inquiry. It really can. And this is what Jesus says. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. A lot of us don't know where to go. Christ is the way. He is the truth, everybody. Okay? So he's not afraid of the truth. You can't handle the truth. Okay. I'm not going to say what movie that was. I'm such a heathen. But it, let me just say something about the Bible. It is truth. 
You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you deny the truth, it will hold you in bondage and break you up. When you deny truth, it's to your own detriment, everybody. I hope you understand that. And so, here we go. It's historically accurate. How do we know? The Bible is true. It's historically accurate. That what the Bible talks about history is accurate. It's not just something that it just talks about. In fact, truth is history. And, and you can see it in the history of the Bible. For the word of the Lord is right and it is true. I, I mean, we talked last week about eyewitness accounts. And remember, we mentioned that. That the Apostle Paul was uh, there five years after Jesus ascended into heaven. He was there, and he was part of the stoning of Stephen. And in 15 years, 12 years later, he was talking to the disciples. 15 years is his earliest writing. The earliest writings in the New Testament had eyewitness. You could ask them, eyewitness news. That's where they got it from. Okay, and I'm just joking, but you know what I'm saying. So you could literally talk to the person who saw there was over 500 witnesses, and you could see it. Even Josephus, a Jewish historian, not a believer, gives credence to these people. Okay, so we had eyewitness accounts. We went through last week we also have that the bible is recorded and copied with extreme care i mean god chose the most meticulous and detailed people you can imagine let me just read about the scribes we didn't have copy machines back in those days they'd take a parchment or papyrus and they'd have to write on them and they would record the scriptures so we go from generation to generation yeah i know what happened they, they, every time they saw it, and I like that. Let's change that. Let's change that. Nope, didn't do that. that. You can see that what is in this Bible is authentic. Let me show you a couple of things, okay? Here is some of the standards that the Jewish scribes had, all right? They could only use clean animal skins, both to write on. So you can't use a, 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 a used um, scribe. And even to bind manuscripts. Each column of writing could have no less than 48 and no more than 60 lines. Sounds like an English class in high school. The ink must be black. That's where motor vehicle got it from. The ink must be black and of a special, I, I mean, this is a side note, but I, we, I married somebody and I wrote it in blue and it wasn't good enough how to be black. So you see, it comes from the Bible. The ink must be black and of a special recipe. They must verbalize each word out loud while they're writing it. They must wipe the pen and wash their entire bodies. Before writing the word Jehovah. Can you imagine that? So holy. I wonder, why don't we see the power of God to, to, to what the Bible talks about today? I think it's God's grace. Because if we treat the word of God lightly and carelessly and don't pay attention to it, God, what I believe he does is he takes the voltage out of what he wants to do in our lives to protect us. A lot of you childproof your houses. You don't want your kids putting their fingers in the socket. So let's give them low voltage. We'll get a little jolt, but they're not going to kill them. I believe, and you can see it, what I'm saying is true to a certain degree. Out of, God, out of God's love for us, he holds the power back because the much is given, much is required. But if you and I will start taking seriously low voltage commands that are easy to do and start listening to God in the small stuff, he will give us more voltage and more power and more of his word. These folks had such reverence for the Bible. We treat the Bible like it's a buffet line. I don't like that. I like that. I like that. Well, my Bible says, okay, so this is what they had to do. The documents, the letters and paragraphs had to be counted, and, and the document became invalid if two letters touched each other. I'm like an English teacher. The middle paragraph and word and letter must correspond to those in the original document. So you'd write it, and you get the original document, and you'd have to go back, and you'd have to see it. The documents could be stored only in sacred places, synagogues, etc. So this is what they would do. And so one of the ways we also know that a, uh, a document is authentic to its original writing, you have the document written, and you have a copy. The more space is that is in between them, the more subject it is to error. Hands down, and I'm not going to give you through all the examples right now to save time. I have, I have all the examples here. But th there's nothing that... In the entire world, uh, any literature, any history that has as much as copies of the Bible and is closer to the date in the Bible. No way at all. We're talking about 400 to 500 year time gaps and most of the writings that we deem as credible history. And yet the Bible has 15 to 20 years in some places. 
perhaps one of the greatest things we can see is the Dead Sea Scrolls. An amazing discovery in 1947 in the Jordan, Valley, Jordan area where you had uh, a Bedouin shepherd was throwing a rock somehow and he heard it break and he went in there and he found these scrolls and they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls, found in 1947. They're absolutely amazing because the earliest Old Testament um, documents we had at the time of this were about 800 to 900 years after Jesus. That's the Old Testament we had. Those are the copies if we date them. Okay, check this out. Do you realize that um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they were written about 100 years before Christ? Written 100 years before Christ, the Dead Sea Scrolls were. Okay, what's the big deal about that? Well, almost all the books of the Bible, except for Esther and a few other places. Do you know what they did? They went back. How much do you think changed within a thousand years? By the way, you have the early manuscripts 100 years before Christ, and the later ones were 900 years after. That's a thousand years between the Old Testament copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the other. A thousand, a thousand years. That's a long time. How much do you think changed in a, a thousand year gap as you compare the text? If, if, if you listen to the contemporaries of today, oh, they changed it. Guess how much changed? About 5%. You know what it was? The spelling of names and people, places and people. That's it. It is absolutely astounding. It's incredible how detailed these scribes were, that you have a, a document, you have the Bible, you have the Old Testament, a thousand years, and there's very little change. In other words, what we're saying is, what we hold in our hand, the Old Testament, is authentic to its original writings. And last week, we spent a little bit more time on the New Testament, the Gospels that we have, the letters of Paul, Peter, James, and John, right? And they are authentic to its writings. The early church fathers knew some of the apostles. And there is a, a line of authenticity for the New Testament and the Old Testament. So what we can say, with a, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Bible that we have in our hands is authentic to its original writings. Okay, it was not changed in, uh, like, like, like the Quran was in other books, like the Book of Mormon was. It wasn't changed. If I just insulted you, I'm sorry. So we had eyewitness accounts recorded and copied with extreme care, archaeological confirmation. For example, I don't know if you realize this, but uh, you can, they used to say, we're not quite sure there really was a city of David. They dig up. The city of David in Jerusalem, what do they find? they find? They find a relief of a building that says King David. They find all these things. They, they find, um, I could go on and on and on. For example, they said the Hittites don't really exist. That was made up in the Bible. Don't go start saying the Hittites. About 30 to 40 years ago, they dug up a city. Guess what they found? The Hittites. The Bible also talks about that Solomon had thousands of horses. Ah, they're exaggerating. They didn't, most people had camels back in that day. They go to Megiddo. They dig it up. We were there. We had a trip, by the way, to Israel. We're going to have one in 2000, 2022. Uh, Lord willing, the creek don't rise. And, and we went there, and we saw horse stables that, we could, that could house hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of horses. So we, there's time after time after time. The Bible says something. You look it up. You can find Jericho. You can find all these places the Bible talks about. The Book of Mormon talks about a great civilization here in America. Listen, I'm not trying to come against the Mormons, but what they're saying is false. You dig and dig and dig, there ain't nothing there. But the Bible says it. You, you see Hezekiah's tunnel, for example. They found that. The Bible talks about how these guys engineered a tunnel so that water could come into the city so they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't dehydrate. Well, oh, that's not really true. Then they dug it up and they find Hezekiah's tunnel. The Pool of Shalom, you can find that where the man was healed. I actually walked through it this through this time. So you can see what the Bible says something. You can go there. You can find it. You can dig it up year after year after year. They're finding more archaeological evidence to support the Bible. There is no contradiction at all. So that's amazing. You have that. It's also scientifically accurate as well. In fact, I will say this. Uh, my third grade, um, can I just ask you a quick question, honey? Sorry, everybody. A little, little. Thank you. I just want to tell her I love her, and she's the hottest thing around. Okay. Uh, okay. Hey, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He, he risen. Okay. It is scientifically accurate that, you know, science 
is all a science is is a discovery of what God did. That's all really a science is. And we can see that the Bible has done that. And in my third grade textbook, a lot of things it said were completely wrong now. What we deem as scientifically accurate is completely wrong. In fact, look at some of these things that used to happen. In the book of Psalms, it says this. Let every creature thing give praise to the Lord, for he has issued his command, and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decrees will never be revoked. Okay, his decrees. What are some of his decrees? What's that all about? Well, let's, let's look at this for a few moments. Truth stays the same, science changes. The truth stays the same, and science changes. And this is what the Bible says. And so we have to realize that God is God. His truth does not change. It's amazing, and you look at it, in 1861, the French Academy of Science came out with a really popular book at the time called 51 Incrovertible Scientific Facts That Prove the Bible is Wrong. And all the science it talked about was disproved. This book is loaded. Can't even find a garbage sale. On a garage sale. Garbage sale. We sell what I think about garage sales. Okay, so that's, that's that. And so, and for example, <clears throat> there's a prevailing wisdom of the day was the earth was flat. Galileo was persecuted by the church because the church believed earth was flat. Does the Bible ever say the earth is flat? Well, let me just stop here for a moment and help us to understand something dogmatically defend what the Bible says. But do not dogmatically defend what the Bible does not say. If something's a poetic book, so be very, very careful that just the Bible says this. It doesn't say that. So what happened is the church made facts out of things that weren't facts. Okay? It wasn't true. It was fictitious facts. And the, what does the Bible say about the earth? God sits enthroned above the what? The circle of the earth. You can see it right there. It's amazing. How about this? People used to think the earth had to be held up. The earth has to be held up. Greek mythology, you had Charles Atlas. Okay, I kind of look like him a little bit. Uh, you have the Hindus. You have the Hindus where you, they, had a, they had a very interesting, I love it, I just sort of did a picture. They, they believe elephants held up the world, uh, and then either that was a turtle and then was a snake. I mean, it's amazing what they believe. And even, um, even the Egyptians... They believed that there was a, a five pillars, the Egyptians believed, held up the earth. And guess who was trained under the uh, Ivy League schooling of that era was Moses. He was in Pharaoh's courts, and he learned under that. You would think that the Old Testament would reflect Egyptian science. It doesn't. God made it. It says in Job 26, 7, the oldest book in the Bible, all right, he spreads out the northern skies above over empty space. He suspends the earth over what? Nothing. There's no animals, thank heavens. There's no elephants. It's just there. We know today it's, crap. it's over nothing. So what the Bible says about science is true. But not all science is in the Bible. I hope you understand that, everybody. See, how about this one? The number of stars could be counted. They used to think they could count all the stars. Now, we know for sure later on, <laughs> the stars of the sky cannot be counted, according to Jeremiah. And my friends, we still can't get all the stars. There are billions and trillions and trillions and billions. You cannot count the number of stars that are out there. The Bible said it many, many millennials ago. You see, the science of the Bible has never contradicted even when the science of its day said otherwise. There's other examples we can show you. For example, too much blood makes you sick, right? You know, do, you know, uh, um, do you know our first president, George Washington, <clears throat> God rest his soul? You know how he died? He was sick after his presidency. They bloodled him three times and he ended up dying. Can you imagine that? You go to the hospital, oh, what's wrong? Oh, we didn't take some blood out of the person. How, how, how foolish is that, right? But what does the Bible say? For the life of the body is in the blood. Okay, I mean, you go on and on and on, and, and how about this one? The priest will quarantine the person for seven days that's infected. The bubonic plague, for example, right? The, the th millions of people died during that time. Guess who was the greatest people that stayed healthy during that time? The Jewish people. Why? They had dietary laws. They had quarantine. And guess who was blamed for much of the bubonic plague? The Jewish people. Why? Because the Bible talked about quarantine. We didn't even know what infectious diseases were in that day. 
yet the word of God told us a long time ago. I'm still having trouble with the shellfish thing. I want my shellfish. Okay. And the words of the Lord are what? Flawless, like purified in the crucible, like gold seven times. The word of God is true. It is true. Not only that, it's also prophetically accurate. What is pro prophecy means hearing something, telling what God says, and often prophecy speaks of what is going to come. And I don't have an illustration to show you today, but um, one of the things that's confusing about biblical prophecy is the prophet sees it all at once and doesn't understand the time in between them. If you can imagine, if you will, that uh, if I'm looking at that wall over there, I don't see the stuff behind here because this is blocking it, but I see that picture. So the prophet will see afar off and see the peaks of the mountains and not see the valleys. And they don't always understand. And so think about the huge risk there is to base a religion on prophecies. Like, for example, the Jehovah's Witness. Jesus was supposed to come back, I don't remember, 1923 or something like that. He didn't come back. Oh, we made a mistake. He came back silently or, or, or secretly. I mean, you constantly have to rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. The Bible doesn't do that. It gives us incredible, um, incredible prophecies. Let me, let me show you one that actually blows, blows me away. I spent about 8 to 10 hours on this this past week. I could literally take the whole hour going through it, so I'm not going to do and bore you, but it's pretty cool. Daniel is absolutely amazing. Daniel, if you do the math and, and calculations, you can actually find that Daniel actually predicts the time when Christ is going to come. And some scholars think it comes up to 27 A.D. If you add the weeks together and what they mean based upon decrees of kings, you can come up with that. I'm not going to get into all that right now, but what I will show you is the general broad strokes of what Daniel has to say and the significance of it. All right? Here it is. Seventy weeks are decreed about, by the way, let me say what happens. Daniel's in captivity. It's getting out. The Bible said in Jeremiah, uh, it's going to have to be 70 years of captivity. It's getting close to 70 years. Daniel's like, hey, God. Uh, the promises, where are they? And he prays, and the angel comes back with an answer. Okay? And so, okay, by, by the way, it's a side note. When God's word says something, go ahead, pray about it. Ask God why. That's what he was doing. So this is what he gets from the angel. All right? So 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgressions, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in an everlasting righteousness. Talking about the sins that Israel did through that point to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and the build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one. Ah, what happens here? The, <laughs> this, the temple was destroyed. What happens? There's a decree from Cyrus, right, to rebuild the temple. We have Nehemiah, and you have Ezra rebuilding. Ezra builds a temple, Nehemiah gets the walls, and then they start reestablishing it, right? There's a decree given. And so Jerusalem is built up again. Now watch it. He's actually telling the history. And he talks about Alexander the Great. Doesn't mention his name, of course. But you can see, uh, talks about kingdoms rising and falling through Daniel. A prince there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat built in troubled time. The temple, Jerusalem, was built in troubled time. What's the troubled time? They were under the occupation of the Romans. Herod built a temple for them. They, they reinstituted sacrificial worship in the temple again. All right? Track with me. And after 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Basically what that means is this. And the anointed one will be killed appearing to have accomplished nothing. Now, who's an anointed one that, that seemed like he, 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 he lost it? Jesus. Why did they put him on the cross? Because he wasn't the Messiah they wanted him to be. Because they didn't see the full picture. He's coming back again. So, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. This is around 27, 80. If you do the math. Amazing. Absolutely, positively amazing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. What did Jesus tell his disciples? You see all these stones? In your time, they're all going to be torn down. What happened? In 70 AD, Rome had enough of the, in, the insurrection of the Jewish people, wiped out the temple, every stone was under, overturned. And then it talks about a new temple being built. Right now in Jerusalem, there are people that are getting all the artifacts ready. The moment they say you can do it, 
and it will pop up so fast, your head will, it, it, it really would. It's amazing. We're on a prophetic time clock here, folks. It's amazing. And it's almost like a certain thing happens, you hit the clock. And so here you have it. And will arise whose armies will destroy the temple in 78. That's what happened. The Jewish were spread out throughout the world. They didn't get back till 1948. 1967, they got the Temple Mount again. But they still haven't built the temple yet. Very significant. Extremely significant. Prophesied thousands of years ago. You can't make this stuff up. It's clear. In fact, it, it says also, and, and he shall make a strong covenant with many one, for one week, and for half the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering, he tells on, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured on a desolator. So again, I just want to show you the context of it. I don't have time to break it out, but now it talks about the end times. So we have a halftime. We had a, we, right, right now we're in halftime. The play, there's an intermission. And the play's going to start again. Christ is going to come back and complete the work he began. This is amazing. There is a book written by uh, Dr. Peter Stoner uh, called Science Speaks. And he had 600 researchers help him about probability. For example, if I have a bucket of tennis balls and I paint one tennis ball red in a bucket of red, so I have nine um, yellow ones and one red one. I put my hand in it. The probability of me picking that out is 1 over 10, right? Well, check this out. One person fulfilling eight prophecies is in 1 in 10th to the 17th power. What is that? That's the number right there. And according to the book, this is amazing. Uh, you know Texas, right? Texas is its own country. Imagine, if you will, taking a silver dollar, spreading the entire state of Texas, two feet of single silver dollars, taking one silver dollar, painting it white. I'm, I'm sorry, painting it red. Put someone in a helicopter to fly over Texas and arbitrarily land it and pick up a pile, pick up a silver dollar, and it's red. That's the probability of, of one person fulfilling eight. Okay? One person fulfilling 16 prophecies is one in the 1045 power. I, I can't even begin to understand. I mean, that's looks like the national debt. I mean, that's, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> Just print more. Just print more. Uh, one person fulfilling 48. I mean, look at that, everybody. Uh, that's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Yet Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. Born in a rich man, uh, um, buried in a rich man's tomb. Comes out of Bethlehem. They, they, how about this? Blow you away. Isaiah 53. You read that thing. Holy mackerel. It actually talks about what he went through, about how he was bruised for our iniquities. It talks about that. Psalm 22 talks about crucifixion before it was even invented. It's amazing. It talks about a virgin show conceived. I mean, all these things in the Bible, there are prophecies over prophecies over prophecies. I can understand trying to make a few take place. But how do you, how do you orchestrate where you're born and where you die and how you die? You can't do that. It's absolutely amazing. How did all this happen in the Scripture? This is how it happened. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, through human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God speaks through people, and they write down by inspiration what he says. In Matthew 26, 56, says this. This is Jesus speaking. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. Jesus actually talks about this with them. In the book of Revelation, it says this. These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show the servants the things that must take place. We're going to have to move on a little quicker here. But let me just go ahead and... I mentioned a few things. It actually, this is true, it actually takes more faith to believe the prophecies of the Bible are coincidence than to believe that God planned them. I mean, how do you make all these coincidences? I can understand one or two. My friends, indisputable. And that's not, there's even, and there's more. 
we're not just talking about that. It's also thematically united. I mean, I get my kids, uh, we wanna, what, let's go out to eat. I want to go to Chipotle. I want to go to Chick-fil-A. I, I, I want to go this way. I want to go. I mentioned Chick-fil-A again. Someone says I mention it every sermon. I do not. <laughs> I don't know why. Lord, help me. If you're watching, give me free lifetime membership. Okay. So anyhow, but what happens is, it, it, is I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. My kids can't even agree on what to eat. And they're my blood. You have. You have. All these people, over, over 40 different authors. 16. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing when you think about how the Bible is 1,600 years, 40 different authors over different countries and continents, and it all agrees together. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. I'm telling you right now, you see Jesus from Revelation all the way to Genesis. You can see the Bible work. It's amazing. The numerology, all, I mean, it all works together. The story, I mean, my friends, it's supernatural. There's no one that could come up with a book like that. No revisions. It is, it's thematically unified. Look what it says in Luke. It says, in the beginning, with Moses and the prophets, he explained them what was said in all the scriptures. The scriptures are important to Jesus, okay? They're important to Jesus. There's no way all these things could happen. Authors could have kept this. No way. There's absolutely no way. And so I want to encourage you to take a screenshot. Bible Project, great way to understand about the Bible. They do an amazing job of simplifying it and helping you understand. Let me move forward. Also, the Bible was trusted by Jesus. A lot of people say, well, we need to unhitch the Old Testament from us. No, Jesus used the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. Jesus trusted the Old Testament. He actually quoted the Old Testament. His life is as a prophetic realization of the Old Testament. In fact, this is what he said. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. What, what, is, what does a family look like? What has God created? What does Jesus say? What does it mean to be... What does it mean to have a family? What does it mean? What does God say about the orientation of male and female? This is not hate speech, everybody. There's a political candidate saying churches need to lose their thing because they're discriminating against. Really? Well, my friend, you'll be dead one day, and so the country will be way gone. Guess what's going to still be around? The Word of God. And... You ask our friends that are here. We have refugees from Iran that had to flee the country. We have a lot of rights in our country. We should exercise our rights. Don't let people stamp all over you. We have rights. Use your rights. Okay? Don't, we're not married to a political party. We're married to our Savior. And we use our rights to defend our rights as U.S. citizens. We have rights. The Apostle Paul said, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do that to me. And we need to do the same. And I stop rolling over. We got to do it in love, however. Okay? This is what Jesus has to say about marriage. Having you ready, replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they became one flesh. There it is. So married, what can one flesh? It's written right there. That, that settles it, everybody. That's, and, and if you go against that design, you know what you do? You hurt yourself and you hurt society. Because you're pulling the Spirit of Christ out of what holds it all together. This is not hate. This is love. God loves us and made us. He knows what's best for us, everybody. Look what he says. I don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them. But I've come to fulfill it. So it was trusted by Jesus. Every letter is inspired and... Um, you know, Jesus talks about that. He even quotes a scripture. Every time he gets attacked by the enemy, he doesn't say, this is what I think. He says, it is written. It is written. When you are attacked by the enemy, and we all are, you have to say it is written. You never overcome this. Yes, I can. You're not forgiven. According to Ma Ma um, 1 John 1, I am forgiven. You have to quote scripture. It's important. Or I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter will disappear. Not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. This is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus speaking. 
And Jesus even quotes scripture. All right, we're going to have to go a little faster here. It's also survived all attacks. You can't stop the Bible. You can't stop the Bible. The Bible is the most despised, derided, denied, disputed, dissected, debated, outlawed, and destroyed book ever. And guess what? Is there any other book on the planet that is hated more than the Bible? Why? It's demonic. People can't stand the truth. The enemy hates the truth. And he utilizes people to go after it. You cannot stop the word of God. Can we read this out loud together? The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen? <laughs> finally, and I really mean finally this time. They say pastor's live when they say in closing. It has transforming power when you add Jesus to it. I'm telling you, it has transforming power. Jesus said this, if you hold to my teaching, do what it says. Do what it says. Trust the Lord. Are we going to trust God? This is not, I mean, come on. Great social experiments and all these things they're doing. They had no idea what, look how good it's going. Look at our culture. Is it going pretty good? You just, you, you evolve from apes? So why not shoot up a high school? Why not massacre people? I'm only an animal, right? All the psychological damage, we talked about this earlier, all the heartbreak. You, you, if you go against this, you're pulling Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, and the things crumble. If you hold my teachings, you're my disciple. Then you know the truth. And the truth will set you free not might will sit are you holding to his teachings there's some parts in here i'm ignoring a little bit are you claiming that income given to caesar what caesar what is god is god bob talks about fornication adultery are we involved with that not because god wants to take away our fun he doesn't want to see us get destroyed by taking the spirit of Christ. Things crumble. Forgive as you've been forgiven. You don't forgive. You pull the spirit of Christ out of your psychology, out of, out of your stress level. No wonder everyone's on medication these days. I'm not against medication. But if you don't forgive somebody, you're causing yourself duress. One of the greatest things in mental health is learning how to forgive others and yourself. And that's what Jesus has done for us. I'm going to ask you to close it. Bow your head and close your eyes, please. Lord Jesus, I recognize, we recognize today. We say we love you. We say we trust you. But Lord, myself included, we treat you like a buffet line. We take a little of this and a little of that, and we leave stuff that you've told us to do. And then we get angry at you because our life's not going like it should. Father, you love us so much, and that's why you've given us your word, a light unto our path, the very truth. And so, Father, we ask right now, forgive us, Father, for choosing to live lifestyles that are against what you've called us to do. You're not trying to limit our fun. You're trying to give us more fun. And so, Father, we ask for forgiveness right now. Maybe the Lord's telling you about certain things that you're allowing in your life that you know is dead wrong. Pirated music. I mean, stuff like that. Just little stuff. Oh, no big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. He's truth. All these things, Lord God. Let me ask you another question. With every head bowed and every eye is closed. Let me ask you a question. How are you with Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? Are you absolutely positive? If I were to die right now, I have absolutely no doubt I'd be in heaven. Why? I've given my life to Christ. I live in forgiveness. I, 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 my life's dedicated. I'm not perfect. I am absolutely for certain. If you don't have that certainty, you can have that certainty today. By putting your life and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you used to walk with God, but you pushed him out. He used to have the whole house. 
Now he's got the closet in the foyer. Push him out of everything. Today's the day of salvation. How many would say today, I used to walk with God and I pushed him out and I want to get myself right with God again. Or how about this, I've never completely surrendered my life to Jesus. It was always a caveat, but are you willing to put that aside and say, God, the best way I know how, I'm giving my life to you. So I know better how to pray. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and say, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time. Or I want to renew my commitment so I can, my eyes can meet yours. Just raise your hand if you would. Whoever would like to do that today. I'll pray with you today. Anyone today? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Okay, let's pray this prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. Today, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. Thank you for what you did is enough. And today, I resign from being the boss of my life. I give my life to you today, completely. Now fill me with your spirit and help me walk the path you have for me today. In Jesus' name, amen.